The following is a production of Freeport Historical Society, keeping the past present since 1969. The Steamboats of Casco Bay was presented at Freeport Community Library Wednesday, January 28, 2015 by Rebecca Hotelling. Rebecca has lived in Freeport for more than 40 years and spent much time sailing the waters of Casco Bay. During her time volunteering for Freeport Historical Society, she conducted research for our 2014 exhibit, You Can Get There From Here, How Transportation Defined Freeport. In the course of that research, she became intrigued with the stories of local steamboats. I have a story to tell you about steamboats in Casco Bay. There was a time on, on Casco Bay when 47 steamboat companies served 94 more landings. To quote William Dunn from his book titled Casco Bay Steamboat Album, Quote, for more than a century, up until the day before World War II, steamboat whistles sounded throughout Casco Bay. Dignified glass, blue tunes, tenor horns, and deep tunes supplied practice notes in the Bay Symphony. George Barrett made this chart, as well as all the other charts, which I will be showing. Also, I would like to acknowledge that um, Rebecca, our office manager, and James Mile, they taught me how to scam. <laughs> <laughs> From Gardner, down the Kennebec River, around the Hartswells, to Portland and beyond to Boston, Castle Bay was a web of intersecting steamboat groups. The competition was fierce, fierce for the best group and the most passengers and the best boat. New steamboat companies were being formed as fast as others went bankrupt. Mergers were common. Our Casco Bay, bay lines of today is the result of several bankruptcies and mergers which took place over many years. I love this picture showing three different kinds of transportation. The sailboat, the horse and buggy, and the steamer. And actually there's a fourth kind of transportation, walking. <laughs> Steamship travel offered, for the very first time, a dependable log schedule. A departure time and an arrival time. Freight and passengers could plan their day. Time spent on the water could be valued as money. The schedule of the Hartswell Steamboat Company offers you five different departures and arrivals, leaving Portland or Ors Island. Let's look at the steamer leaving Portland at 9 a.m. and arriving at Ors Island. Um, 9 a.m. and it has eight stops and it arrives in Orr's Island just a, in a little under two hours. That is a fast moving steamer. <laughs> it is hard, it is difficult even today to take a car from Portland to Orr's Island in less than two hours. <laughs>
One of the first great steamboats of Casco Bay was the Aqua Cisco, 107 feet long, built in South Portland in 1897. She was built for the Hartswell Steamboat Company. Her name is a Tinga name, meaning place of the heron or resting place. I only see two lifeboats and a big <laughs> on the side. There might be two lifeboats, but that boat is a big cloud. This is an ad in 1899 encouraging you to board this lovely steamer and enjoy the cool breezes of Casco Bay. You might choose from four different day and round trips to to Long Island, She was 136. 
six feet long, 29 feet wide, 9.6 feet deep. She cost $75,000 to build. <laughs> Her interior is lavish. The main saloon is upholstered in white and gold trim. The men's smoking room is finished in oak, and Spanish leather covered the chairs. The ladies' cabin is decorated in blue plush. Red carpeting was laid throughout. Brass rails adorned the stairs and decking. Ample views were seen from the large windows. I quote from a friend, George Terrian, who remembers at five years old meeting the ferry at Harpswell. Quote, I remember meeting the steamer coming across Casco Bay from the direction of Portland every midday. Long before the vessel was sighted, I could see an impertinent stovepipe of a stack and a plume of dark smoke. A long, shrill whistle would be sounded reverberating for some time after it had ceased its sounding. His father would claim the mail, while George watched with great fascination the landing of this very large boat at high on the tide. Steamboats transformed the islands of Casco Bay from secluded farms and private residences into scenes of brisk social life. Steamboat companies developed the islands with the intent of giving you a destination to come by steamboat. This ad put out by the Forest City Steamboat Company is telling you how great it would be to visit Peaks Island so you could enjoy <coughs> the Forest City ice rink, a pavilion, and a roller coaster all on Peaks Island. The rink was transformed into the Gem Theater, which was the first stock theater in Maine. That's a huge ring. Also on Peaks was the Greenwood Gardens Amusement Park, built in 1870 by Captain Howard Knowlton. Peaks Island also offered 21 hotels and boarding houses. 21 hotels and boarding houses ranging from the large Peak Island House, which is pictured here, and the Coronado Hotel. Many of the islands offered dinner, overnight accommodations, and gambling. As early as 1881, one could stay at the American Eve House on South Harpswell. Prior to 1880, Great Diamond, which is right here, oh. right, that's Great Diamond, was populated by farmers and fishermen. Cattle roamed the island. In 1882, a group of Portland citizens, led by E.P.G. Smith, for an exclusive summer colony on Great Diamond. Sale of the land was strictly controlled. Several cottages were built. Only one farmer was allowed to sell his milk and vegetables to the colony, and only one store allowed to operate. To further ensure their exclusiveness, they bought the steamboat Isis, pictured here, to transport only the summer colony to the island from Portland and back. <coughs> Cushing Island and Shabik Island all had their fair share of great hotels. Great Shabik had two large hotels. The Hamilton House pictured here was one of them. And the Hillcrest Hotel was another one. And this hotel here, I believe, uh, replaced what's now today the Great Shabik Inn. Cushing Island offered the Great Ottawa House, which could accommodate 250 people. Long Island had three major hostelries, a 150-room Granite Spring Hotel, and two smaller inns. Not to be outdone, Little Shabik had a hotel, a bowling alley, and a large community building for plant -based. Steamboat companies teamed up 
work with real estate developers to form resorts or summer colonies on islands. One such development was the Birch Island Land Company. That's Birch Island. 242 cottage lots were laid out on 68 acres on what had been the Merriman Farm. Since successful promotion of the development, along with light developments proposed for French Island and Upper and Lower Goose Islands, that I believe is French and Upper and Lower Goose, several steamboat and several <coughs> steamboat companies were formed in order to be a reliable source of transportation to these islands. When the public showed little interest in these colonies, the small steamboat companies went broke, and that was not an unusual happening. The steamboats traveled every part, crook and cranny, of Casco Bay and beyond. Just to give you an idea of their ubiquity, I will name but a few of the steamboat companies. The, Presum the Presumscot River Steamboat Company, the Stroudwater Steamboat Company, the Grunet Steamboat Company, the New Meadows Steamboat Company. I would now like to turn our attention to Freeport. In the 1870s and 1880s, steamboat navigation flourished, but the inner bay, the northeasterly reaches of Casco Bay, which included Freeport, did not see service until 1884. I'm going to back up a bit in time and talk about Seward Porter. Seward Porter of Porter's Landing and Freeport gave Casco Bay its first island steamboat, the Kennebec, picture here, in 1822. Seward's father, Nehemiah Porter, was a revolutionary veteran and moved to Porter's Landing in 1782. He had 11 sons. <laughs> Seward is said to be the business genius of the family. He and his brothers built the Dash in 1814. It was built by Brewer Shipyard in Freeport. After the sinking of the Dash, Captain Porter ran a steam sawmill in Bath. The mill was, was not profitable, and he then turned to using steam to power a boat. The Kennebec was a flat-bottomed gondola fitted with a crude steam engine. A, a gondola is a flat-bottomed barge um, moved by either oar or sail. Her engine proved too inadequate for the swift currents and tide of the Kennebec River. Undotted, Seward took her to Portland for use among the islands. He fitted her out with a sharp prow, he raised her sides, and he put two wheels on either side of her. She carried contented passengers and loads of freight. Despite that she was known as a horned hog, her passengers were very fond of her. Riding her among the islands was a lot more comfortable than rowing and a lot more dependable than a sailing boat. She acquired a loyal following. Louis Pease, a local versifier and constable from Portland, wrote the following in honor of the Kennebec. A fig for all your clumsy craft, your pleasure boats and packets. The steamboat lands you safe and soon at Mansfield's trots and brackets. And down below they keep the stuff, and everything is handy. My jolly boys, I'll tell you what, that steamboat is a dandy. <laughs> Yet the wonderful Kennebec was a fair weather boat. Strong winds or tides would set her off path and upset her schedule. Captain Porter was not to be defeated. He purchased another steamer from New York. In 1823, the patent and her part in Portland Harbor. I have been unable to find a picture of the patent. If anyone has one, that would be great if they'd share it with me. She was the most substantial steamer at that time to be seen in Maine. She was built in 1821 in Medford, Massachusetts. 
She was 80 feet long and 21 feet wide. She had two masts, cabins below, an engine below, a huge wheel above deck. She cost $20,000 to build and was capable of 10 miles per hour of speed. That's knots. I mean, it's miles per hour, not knots. She was the first steamer to offer overnight accommodation from Boston to Bath. It was not until 1848 that the patent met the competition. As an aside, Captain Porter became a map maker, and the Ocean Map Library has a set of 10 of her charts. They're very, very nice charts of, uh, charts of the coast of Maine. J.P. Raymond built the first steamboat to serve Freeport in 1860. Her name was Tyrone. Um, I want to just show, just familiarize you a bit with the landings around Freeport. That's North Yarmouth Landing, South Freeport, Porter's Landing, Mass Landing, Denison's Mill, Wolf's Neck Landing, Buston's Island, Mirror Point, and Burnt Island. Hold raw materials from Denison, Mass Island, and on down to Portland off the map. I do not have a picture of the tower, but I do have a picture of the bridge under which she passed on her way to Denison's Mill. <laughs> This picture is donated by David G. Cotton, a tireless and resourceful volunteer for the Freeport Historical Society. She had a collapsible smokestack to allow her to pass under the <laughs> <laughs> Even if she did have a collapsible smoke, smokestack, it is difficult to see how any steamboat could pass under the bridge. But I think what made it possible was that the bridge was higher above the water than it is today, and the water was deeper than it is today. Before the silting had fallen, before the silting and fallen banks of the river occurred. Soon she was transporting passengers to Portland. A fire, most likely due to her smokestack, put her out of business for several years. She was replaced by the steamboat Harrisina, which was also built on Freeport. Mr. Weeman, later on in 1881, started a hardware store in Freeport. I could find out very little about Mr. Weeman, only that he had built the Tyro and started the hardware store. If anyone else has any other information about him, it would be great. This bridge is the same bridge that's right now on um, Lower Bath, I mean, on uh, North Street of Flying Point Road, depending on where you cut the line. And um, this bridge was the one that the Tyro did go under. It has since fallen apart, and another one has been built right where that one is. But the one that we have today would never allow a boat underneath it. And off to the right is the old house known as the Kelsey House or the Browder Home. Mm. And that's David Hoffman's mother's house up on the hill. Freeport did not see regular steamboat service until 1884. Captain Horace B. Townsend from a locally prominent family in Freeport in 1883, employed workmen, quote, to carry axes and bandsaws under the lush timberland of Staples Point at Freeport. Their chore was to cut down enough sturdy oak trees to provide the keel and frames for a small steamboat christened Haney after the Captain Townsend's daughter. Again, I do not have a picture of Haney. And I'm surprised that I cannot find pictures of such memorable boat. The Haiti was 46 feet long, 14 feet wide, and 5 feet deep. <coughs> Although I don't have a picture of her, I do have a ledger, again found, found by David Coffin at the Historical Society, showing, among other ex expenses, dividends were paid out in the amount of 2000 $633.44. The Haiti had several owners, which was not uncommon. Captain Townsend, or I should say Horace B. Townsend was her captain and her primary owner. <coughs> captain 
Munchausen, Sting the Haney, between um, Salisburyport and Shabika Island. This route put her in direct competition with the Hartsville Line, which also made a stop in Portland. In order to meet his competition, Captain Townsend put the Haney on a new run from Freeport to Portland with a stop at Town Landing in the Free in Alfalma's Forsyth down here. So he would go from there, there, and now on to Portland. His enterprise was now called the Freeport Steamboat Company. By 1886, the Haney was very busy and hard pressed to keep up with the demands of passenger and freight business. It was not long before Captain Townsend teamed up with Captain Horace B. Soule, also of South Freeport, to make another steamboat, this one named the Phantom. She was built in 1887. Her length was 65 feet, her width 18 feet, and she was 6.1 feet deep. The Phantom, according to ledgers, paid out dividends to 14 owners whose names include a myriad of souls. E. E. Bell was up here also. There. Small, Gore, Merrill, and Von Magla. She cost $1,000 to build. Horace B. Soule became captain of the Haney and Captain Townsend skipper of the Phantom. Although the Phantom was a success financially, she was called a grotesque looking thing. Her derrick boom, which is that thing sticking out and down, used for, uh, her derrick boom used for lifting freight onto the ship contributed to her ugliness that gave her a lot of freight business in addition to the passengers. She's a little different looking than the Alta Cisco or the American, American or the um, National. To quote, among her steady accounts, wholesale plans shipped from Hamilton Brothers on great shipping alone numbered several thousand barrels each year. Brute strength and steamboat deckhand can be a real asset. Take powerful David B. Coffin, one of the hardier of the Phantom's restaurants. To this day, stories have been handed down telling how he can manhandle a full wooden barrel of clams off the deck, raise it to his chest, and hurl the bodily to the top of a wall at low tide. I have a picture here of David Coffin taken in the 1890s at his home on Wolf's Neck with his wife. <laughs> with bright prospects for the future, in 1894, the Freeport Steamboat Company extended its line to Bustons, Mirror Point, the Hartswell Lookout. The Hartsville line with warships, personnel, and better schedules had formed the work shipping, passenger, and freight business. In addition, there were rumors of an electric railway of trolleys, which would serve communities as far as the Cumberland Yarmouth line. 1896 was the last year of the famine. She was sold to the Fountain Steamboat Line in 1895 for $708.31. Remember, she cost a thousand dollars to build. Eventually, she ended her life as a sardine carrier in Eastport. Captain Townsend died in 1907. He was born in 1838. His obituary in the Brunswick Times states he was born in Freeport, the son of Enos and Clementine Townsend. Quote, he always had made his home in Freeport. During his life, he was engaged in shipbuilding and worked in the shipyards here and in Europe and down Scotland. The last few years, Captain Townsend had a shop at South Freeport and built boats. Captain Townsend married Miss Mary Dunning, 
a negative, a free pork. End of quote. The life of the free pork boat company is a good example of how cutthroat the steamboat ship business was. It was not long before the railroads wanted to cash in on the lucrative steamboat trade. Maine Central Railroad went to Philadelphia and had the steamboat Norm Vega built. I've already mentioned that the Hartsville Line had followed Maine Central Railroad in having her Mashadone also built in Philadelphia. With the entry of the railroads, it was possible for people living inland, away from the water, to have an easy access to travel by steamboat. This combination of rail and steam gave many people unrestricted freedom of travel, which had been reserved for the few. Although the road, railroads might have been one of the reasons for the demise of the steamboat, at one time they abetted steam travel. Many of those 94 wharf landings were the reason for a road. As early as 1770, a road 20 rods wide was laid out between Porter's Landing and Freeport Square. When we visualize the steamers and their routes, we do not see coves and landings. We see water connecting a great archipelago of islands. The water is the highway. U.S. Route 1 and its tributaries or local roads to North Yarmouth and Powell are a recent newcomer. Route 1's path along the coast along the coast was the path between steamboat landings. Seen in this light, Bunnelup Road takes on a new meaning. She was a means of connecting water travel. In summary, steamboats are an exciting and profitable part part of Maine and Freeport history. They provided business with a reliable form of transportation. Could we say the steamboat brought tourism to Casco Bay? The steamboat, along with the railroad and trolley, developed the islands and the coastline. Roads were for local use. The steamboat provided long distance travel, especially when they partnered with the railroads. This is the story of the steamboats. This is a picture of the modern day San Francisco. Thank you.